Good morning, Saint fans, and welcome to episode 35 of season two, Sports Talk with Rags. And today we are joined here by head varsity football coach Mike Beal for Dancement Suffolk Academy. Coach Beal, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing great, man. Thank you so much for having me. Sure, no problem. Hey, I've had uh, Coach Aston, Coach uh, Thornburg, Coach Furman, and uh, Coach Seal on uh, earlier episodes. So glad to have uh, have an episode here to talk about NSA football. Yeah, man, I was feeling a little left out. I had to join the party <laughs> at some point, so I appreciate it. <laughs> sure. Hey, uh, before we get started uh, talking about NSA football, uh, let's start here at the here at the beginning when uh, when you were playing, and I know that I grew up on uh, the Chesapeake side, but definitely uh, remember uh, you being under center there for uh, Salem High School. Yeah, absolutely. A long time ago at this point. Date, we're dating ourselves right now, but um, just like you said, um, I grew up in Virginia Beach, went to Salem High School, um, Played for one head coach, Tim O'Reilly, for my first three years, and then was was really lucky enough to play with uh, Chris Beatty my final year. And um, kind of like what we said prior to, we had all the the makings of a really good football team, and um, I think we just kind of fell into the right opportunity at the right time with Coach Beatty bringing the spread offense to the seven five seven, and really which it sounds crazy to hear now, but we were the only school that was doing it back then. Um, everybody was still fairly wing T ish or pro style and, um, his ability to come and teach us that offense really on the fly with the type of talent that we had allowed us to really, really just get to our full potential. And, um, I've said it before and I'll say it again, that was probably the most fun I've ever had playing a game that I already love, but we went on, uh, got our first playoff appearance at Salem. Um, and then really. A lot of the guys on that team used that opportunity to go play at the next level. And like you said, I went um, from Salem High School to Iona College, which probably people probably know that as a basketball school. But back in the day, it was it was an FCS program, one double A, um, and that was my dream. I wanted to go play Division One college football, and I got to do that really because of the opportunities that Coach Beatty afforded me um, in high school. But went to Iona. Unfortunately, I blew my same knee out that I blew out in high school um, at the end of my spring of freshman year. So redshirted and then battled back, but was lucky enough to start over 20 games uh, in college. And and that's really what I tell kids all the time, like go where you're going to have the best experience. And if, if it's about being on a big time team, then go to the biggest program that you can make to be a part of that team. But if it's to go and contribute and play, you have to know what that looks like too. And for me, that's that was the the biggest decision maker for me. Like, do I go to a JMU, a William and Mary, or one of these bigger programs where man, I'll be a part of the team, but it's gonna be really tough for me to get on the field, or do I go to a smaller division one school where I don't know if I'm gonna get on the field, but I know I'm gonna have a fair shot. And um, luckily enough for me, I, that was the right decision. Um, like I said, I got to play a lot of ball there. But that's where I met some of my best friends. Um, I met my my wife at college. Um, so none of those things. My life would be markedly different had I not made that decision. Um, but moving right along, I, I played there. I got hired at Iona as the quarterbacks coach right when I graduated, which was a huge opportunity. Um, I coached there for spring. And funny story, I, I went home. I had to go home in the summer so I could live there, so I could have enough money to, to right. live in New York. Right. Um, so I come home, work my job, and we're talking the third week in July. So two, two and a half weeks until camp starts, I get a call from Coach Beatty. He was at Northern Illinois at, at the time. He was the running back coach. I'm on my little supervisor route, looking at pools, and he's like, that's what you need to do. You need to schedule the GRE, take the test, do well enough, and then buy a ticket for Monday to come to Chicago and, and interview. And I did, and it, and it all worked out. And that was my first um, my first graduate assistant job was at Northern Illinois and just jumped right in feet first and, and 
you know, tried to learn as much as I could, which there was probably more than more than enough things for me to learn. But right after that season, our head coach, Joe Novak, retired. And it was it was a shock to all of us. But um, as a graduate assistant, I mean, I didn't know anyone. I didn't have any kind of I mean, the guy that I knew got me the job and now he's looking for a job. So <laughs> I was in DeKalb, Illinois um, for about four months after they hired Jerry Kill to take over the program. And lucky, luckily enough, again, um, through Coach Beatty, uh, Kent State called and they had a okay. graduate assistant job open and it was super lucky. They had hired somebody that kid got a better job at Ohio state. So they were vacant right, right before camp. Yeah. So I called, called their head coach. He said, do you want the job? I said, I'll be there today. Right. Right. <laughs> I will make the six and a half hour trip today. Um, and again, that was just another great opportunity. I spent the next three years there learning from some of the best coaches I've ever been around. Um, three, three different coaches on that staff went to the NFL. Two of them are still in there. Um, but just got to look at the game from a different perspective because really I was on the defensive side of the ball rather than offensive. And that opened it everything up to me. Like I'd always known how to attack defenses from from our perspective offensively. I had never turned my, my scope around. And, and that gave me the opportunity to do that. Um, so moving and, right along. Go ahead. And no, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that you were at uh, Kent State, but – I know that uh, for all the listeners out there, uh, Antonio Gates yep. is from uh, Kent State, and I know where Kent State is because I've had uh, a cousin, his wife, and then uh, another cousin. Uh, her kids have actually gone to school there at uh, there at Kent State. It's a great place. It's a, it's, yeah. a, it's one of the worst kept secrets in the Midwest because it's getting more and more notoriety. You know, the more success they've had over the last five, 10 years. But speaking of Antonio Gates, my last year there, I got to meet him and James Harrison. They were both they were both inducted into the Kent State Hall of Fame the same day. Um, Josh Cribbs is another one that that would be around every once in a while. When I was there, Julian Edelman was our quarterback. So and we had some really talented alumni that that were always present. But. Uh, I mean, they've put on put out so many professional athletes over the last 10 or 15 years. And it's just, you know, it's fun to see them getting some of that no, notoriety that they probably deserved a long time ago because there's great players from there. Right. And then um, so to get back uh, what it was just time to come back to the 757. Yeah. Well, at the time, like I said, I met my future wife. She was she was teaching in her hometown in Pennsylvania while I was doing the graduate assistant deal. Um, and it felt like two things. One, we wanted we wanted to settle down and, and move forward and start a family and do all that. But I was dying to coach at that point. I felt like uh, from an experience standpoint, I was ready to ha at least have my own position group and, and affect kids in a positive way. And I'd always told myself that I wanted to stay in college football, but it just felt like that was the time to really see if I'm a if I'm a coach, I need to go do this right now. And I knew I would be able to get an opportunity helping someone on a staff um, if I moved home. So that's what we did. Did, did the old move back with the parents and stayed with them for a couple months while we uh, while we made enough to go get an apartment. And then you know from there everything kind of took off. We moved back and. I immediately joined uh, Kellum's football staff. My dad was still the principal there. Okay. Um, and I, I've known Chris DeWitt for ever, since I was right. 12 or 13. He was my JV coach at Salem. Right. Oh, okay. so he was great. You know, right off, right off the bat, he said, well, why, don't you, why don't you take quarterbacks? You know, you can take them for individual. That's your, that'll be your job. You take it. And it was awesome because, again, I got to jump in. Um, just understanding everything that goes with having that position. And, and it was great. It was a great learning experience. Um, went from there while I was coaching at, at Kellum, I was teaching as a TA at Tallwood. And I was just making oh. the trip back and forth. Again, timing, <laughs> timing is, is everything. At the end of that, 
football season, maybe three weeks after that football season ended, there was a coaching change at Tallwood and John Keppel was hired. A couple weeks after that, I I took the the one class to get endorsed as a special ed teacher and, and I was hired as a full-time teacher. Literally, we're talking maybe days between each other. John called and said, look, I know you just got hired here. I know you're teaching or coaching at Callum, but you're going to teach here full time. Like, let's let's keep you here as a coach. We didn't know each other very well, other than uh, I knew who he was as the defensive coordinator at Tallwood. He knew who I was as a player. But outside of that, never really had any conversations. But the more I thought about it, I was like that, that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to be a teacher here. Like, let's be all in. You know, yeah. let's not let's not spread ourselves too thin. And that was, again, great, great decision and opportunity there. And that's where I stayed um, for the next six years. And it was, it just, the more I got to work with John and those kids at Tallwood, the more I got to put on my plate. And I feel like the more prepared I was for that next step. And, um, I think the first season I coached safeties cause he knew that I was a defensive GA. So I was coaching two guys on the field. And I'm going to tell you what, Mark, they were getting coached up. <laughs> right. yeah. they were getting, I was, that was my job. I'm like, I'm not worried about anything. I got the safeties. I'm grading right. them out like a, like a yeah. college guy every week. And they loved it. But right when the season ended, um, John was like, I, I think you should, you should be the DC. You, should, you be the coordinator and take over the weight room. Let me be a head coach, which I thought that that took a lot for him to say, but great opportunity for me. Right. So I did that for the next, um, four years I was yeah. in DC took over the weight room and was just again the, the longer you're out of place the more experience you get the more stuff you get to put on your plate and I got to really work hand in hand with John and, and see the day-to-day -day things that he had to take care of as a head coach that I wouldn't wouldn't have gotten the opportunity to see had I not been in that position um but then that final year we lost Matt Lem was our offensive coordinator so I took over the OC position. And then I was at that point, it was like, man, I feel like really prepared. Right. So, you know, you're, you're an assistant for so long and you feel like you're putting long hours in and, and making a difference. And now you're just looking for an opportunity. And that that's kind of where I was at when my family friend, Kevin Rogers, he was the offensive coordinator at Wayman Mary at, at the time. Okay. He stopped in at NSA to check yeah. on Noah Giles, the running back yeah. that he had recruited. Yeah, then, Lou Johnston had just resigned. He just retired, right. and uh, Coach Rogers stopped and talked to our AD and was like, "Well, who are you guys going to hire?" This is like a month, two months after the season or so. They just won the state championship, and right. and our AD here was like, "Man, we don't. We've interviewed some people, but we don't know." Well, if anybody has ever met Kevin Rogers, he does not. He doesn't mince words. He's going to tell you exactly what's on his mind and, and very direct. <laughs> So he kind of in his style kind of leaned back and looked at our AD. He's like, well, I got a guy like you should look at him. He's over at Tallwood. He, he could definitely he could definitely take this job. And he called me afterward and said, I, you might be getting a call from this guy. <laughs> out of school. I don't know anything about NSA. Right. But what I didn't know was he was the second guy to kind of throw my name in there. Mark Harrison over at Salem was my AD when I was a, a kid there. He called ahead and was like you should look at this guy yeah. so that kind of put everything in place and um got the call went on an interview had never been to nsa really wasn't familiar with private private school football had you asked me five years before if if i thought i would end up in private school football i'd probably laugh and say no but um after i met the people and walked the campus and and really learned a little bit more about it i kind of leaned back and said man I would hate to be in this position next year as an assistant, wondering what that would have been like. Right. Um, and I mean, I, I kind of live by the the credo of just don't have, don't have any excuses, don't have any regrets. And I right. think I would have really regretted not taking a chance on this opportunity. And, and this is my seventh year here now. And um, I'm just really happy with where this program has been built to and we've got ways to go. But man, we've we've had a ton of really talented, good kids come through here, and um, I, like I said, I have no regrets about being here. It's been great.
Yes, I know that uh, with uh, growing up here in uh, Western Branch, I know that I had some friends that went to NSA, you know, to uh, play baseball, play play football, mm-hmm. you know, but really didn't didn't go over to uh, NSA when I was in high school to watch their athletic program until my nephews started going to Greenbrier Christian, gotcha. you know, and uh, with the TCIS and and everything and then my wife and I having friends that their uh, that their kids were student athletes or part of the band you mm-hmm. know um there and I know with the home football games you know it was it was nice that NSA didn't charge and it's like uh <laughs> it's like a community atmosphere yeah. now it's been a couple years since I've been to a game but I know when Noah Giles played and even um uh, Marshall, if you're listening, I mean, even even a country singer that performed on American Idol yep. played at NSA. Right. <laughs> That's right. He was he was a senior right before I got here. But right, you you, you hit on a good point. I mean, we've had some really really talented kids. And speaking of that team, his team I think had seven kids go on to play college football. Which, I mean, whether you're talking about private school or public school, that's that's a talented group of players they're getting a chance to play at the next level. And now, you know, we've had Keyshawn Moore, who's now at Hampton, but originally at JMU and and with George Petaway. You know, I think, um, like we mentioned before we got on, it, it, if you're talented enough, they find you. And we've just been really lucky to have some of those talented kids that make the most of their opportunity, make the most of their opportunity and, and do what they need to do in the classroom um, to be as recruitable as possible, but then take care of business on the field. And, and that's the biggest thing I, I tell parents when they take a tour and they ask because um, they want to know if their kid can get recruited and have a right. chance to go play at college. And, um, yeah. you know, I literally say the same thing. You, you've got to take care of all the controllables. And, and if you do that, you'll have a chance. But then it's about whether you perform well enough on the field in the classroom. And that's that's going to be different for everyone. But like I said, I think with with us putting a lot of kids into college, Atlantic Shores obviously is on a run right now where they're they're putting a ton of kids in college. I think it's opening people's eyes that said, maybe, maybe this is an option. And that's that's really all we can ask for is to get a fair shake from parents that are looking to put their kid in a position to be successful. Yes, and then also, uh, I mean, not only to go to a military academy, but also get a chance to play in the NFL, you know, uh, Cole Christensen, Mm -hmm. you know, there with uh, being an alum and having a great career at Army and uh, getting uh, opportunity there with the there with the Chargers. You know, it's just, uh, yeah, I mean, like like you've said before, if you put in the work, you know, they will uh, they will find you. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think not to sound like like the old get off my lawn type guy. I think everybody in a lot of instances is looking for the quick fix or the easy answer or the what's the fastest track to get here. And and that's the beautiful thing about our sport. There is none. Right. You have to put in the work. You have to be genuine about wanting to get it done. And you have to be able to put your resume on film every time. And if you do that, good things happen. Um, like I said, luckily for us, we've got some great examples. Cole, Cole's probably the greatest example of just not taking no for an answer because that was a kid coming out of high school. I mean, he broke the tackle record for this school by, by like hundreds of tackles. <laughs> it was very clear that he could play. Um, but for whatever reason, he wasn't as recruited as, as a kid like him should be. And he had other options to do some different things, but he took took the road less traveled and, and did the work. And here he is. I mean, I watched their last preseason game. I think he had eight tackles in the time that he was in. So he's proven that he belongs in that league. And that's, that's awesome for our community to see and our players right now to see like, look that he, he is literally against all odds on top of being a service Academy kid, getting a never a second and third year shot at the NFL. Like that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> It just yeah. doesn't, yeah. So, so your time at NSA, I mean, uh, you know, you start off, you know, the first couple years, and then, and then the pandemic um, ha- 
happened and you know somebody asked me you know hey mark what do you what do you think about student athletes high school senior versus a college senior and i said well i think it's harder for the high school senior cuz the college mm-hmm. you can have another another year of eligibility work on your masters or work on a minor mm-hmm. the high school you know if you didn't reclass before the before the school year started you know, you know, it's going to be harder to go to that next level. I mean, so uh, how has your time there at uh, NSA? I mean, finally getting out of out of things and everything seems to be back on a normal off season schedule and everything. Yeah, it's it's a welcome. It's a welcome deal. There's no doubt about that. The funny thing is, right when I got to NSA, they were coming off of a state championship, but they graduated over 25 seniors on that on that team, oh, wow. which like if we're talking about a, a public school team of 110, you're like, yeah, that's pretty average. I mean, not at a school our size. <laughs> we graduated 25 plus the first day of, of uh, preseason. I've got 19 pairs of eyeballs looking at me and I'm wondering, like, we can't go 11 on 11 right now. <laughs> so, it, you talk about building from the ground up. Um, and that, that's exactly what we had to do. Um, and we think about that, like you're really recruiting within your building. You're, you're trying to make it uh, an atmosphere that kids look at from the outside looking in saying, man, I want to be a part of that. And, and we were able to do that year after year after year. We started with 19. Following year, we had 27. Following year, with 30. Year after that, we're, we're closer to 40, 45, where you want to be. And then the pandemic hits. And I'll tell you, the, obviously, the pandemic affected literally everyone in every way. It just degrees would vary based on your, your situation. But with us, we had built a culture that was really around the off season, like most schools. Like, man, you have to put the time and effort into getting in the weight room, spending time with each other, doing all those things so that by the time the spring hits, we can hit the ground running and do all those things. But when when COVID happened, clearly all that was was put to a grinding stop. And the unfortunate thing was, which I think everybody would, would agree with looking back on that, and how detrimental it was for our kids to just not be around other kids doing right. the activities that they had grown accustomed to doing forever, and my, myself included. Um, I, I can remember that first summer where everything was shut down us the first summer in 20 plus years i was not in a training camp and at one point my wife had to kind of give me the side eye and just say like it's this is not our fault i didn't even know what she was talking about at the time but she's like you you're you're like really negative projecting around me and and i had to take a step back say yeah you're right but i was angry i was angry i was out of my element because I'm the type, which most most coaches are, you give me the date and the time, I can tell you what I'll be doing. Might vary like specifically what, but I'll, I'll tell you where I am, what we're working on that day. And, and when that's taken away, man, that's, that's the foundation. Um, so I, I can't imagine what it must have been like to these kids who are living it. I mean, I think as an adult, you have a little bit more perspective, you experience some different things. So you you have a wife that says, hey, take a deep breath. What's a kid supposed to do? Um, at the same degree, just like you mentioned, um, the, the high school seniors and juniors that went through that. I mean, you talk about a raw deal. We had Griffin Duggan. Griffin Duggan was getting recruited by Power 5 schools. He was, set, he was told, if you come to camp as a, as a junior, we're going to probably offer you a scholarship. So he does those things and he, he turns heads and does a good job, but really needed his senior film to be the thing that closed the door on that. Well, COVID happens, so he doesn't get spring recruiting going into his senior year. Summer comes around. The season is canceled. So now we're like, all right, no big deal. You know, you just got to use this shortened season to go do your thing. Well, by the time shortened season happens, we're talking about six-year seniors getting eligibility. By the time spring hit, after he, he had a great season, 
people didn't have spots available. Like he got offered by Delaware. And I think three days after he got offered, they literally passed the, the extra COVID year. So I got a call from Delaware that said, man, I hate to tell you this, but we literally don't have, we don't have a scholarship to give. We, we love them, but we don't have one. And a lot of schools were in that boat. And, and what do you, you know, what do you tell a kid in that situation? Like, let's just make it work. Well, okay. Tell me how. And, and <laughs> there was no way until the dust kind of settled and you, you figured out how we're going to navigate this. Um, but yeah, just a tough, tough, tough deal to go back on the program building stuff when everything began to open back up. Obviously we're, we're rejoicing that we get to get back to some normalcy and, and some kind of routine. But now the kids that are in the program have never been through an off season. Now they've never made it a point to come to off season programming right. and, and put four to five days of work in a week where, we had that as the expectation prior to. So that's kind of where we are now in terms of trying to build that back up, which I'm sure most programs are. And it's it this this off season was much better than last. And you've got to keep that keep that whole deal growing so you can get back to the standard that you know you should be at. But that's that's where we're at. And um, you know, we've got ways to go, but but we've got some promising, talented kids leading the way. So It'll be interesting this year for sure. Yeah, and uh, last year, I mean, we brought up uh, George. You know, uh, he's he's at Carolina. You know, um, I uh, I saw that uh, you guys uh, uh, scrimmaged uh, Edenton. So uh, how's um, how's this uh, this season looking? And with the uh, off season practice. You know that that build to when the green flag uh, shows up for the regular season games. Yeah, um, like I, we had a great group last year. I mean, a great group. Um, not only with George, but another kid, Christian Townsend, is playing at CNU. David Russell was an All-State kid. He's playing lacrosse um, in the at the collegiate level. But just so many really talented older guys that we've had to fill spots for Josh Morris, another all state guy that was playing middle linebacker for us. But we had so many kids that got great experience last year. It's just that they have to step in roles much bigger than what they're used to. And we've got to make it happen fast. Um, but we have some guys, we have some guys, our quarterback, Gabe Wansert is really coming into his own. He's a kid that started for us last year. But he's got a really interesting story. He's from Hawaii. He played his freshman year in Hawaii. His parents moved um, into the Chesapeake area his sophomore year, and then COVID hit. Mm. So for two years or so, all he did was was do camps and seven-on-sevens. So then we get him, and I see this kid throw, and I'm like, he is, I mean, this is a talented thrower of the football. There's no doubt about it. But he hadn't played live football in two years. Like, think about that. Um, it's not a pro. Like, that's, this is a kid. So he had to really ramp the learning curve up last year. And it was it was a process. And by the end of the year, we were really happy with where he was. But But now it was, you know, can you put the time and effort in to be at this level, if not higher? when the following season starts and he's done that he's put in all the work and you can tell he looks like a different kid in the pocket, really, really decisive. But the thing that I really liked in terms of the Edenton scrimmage last night, there was chaos in his face at all times when he was dropping back and he just stuck his foot in the ground and threw it on time. And I mean, you've watched enough football. It's really, that's really tough to defend when you have a kid back there that doesn't waver in the face of a rush. And that's where he's at right now. But he also has some, some really talented guys to throw it to. Isaiah Furman is a, is a basketball football star. That's getting some, he's really starting to get some notoriety on the basketball court. He's got a couple of division two um, division three opportunities for basketball, but he's a six foot five, 190 pound outside receiver that has great ball skills, great instincts. He's physical. Um, I think, 
if he does what I believe he's capable of doing this season, he's going to have a lot of opportunities. We've had a ton of college coaches come in and kind of take a look at him and, and just say, that's what a power five receiver tight end looks like. Um, we have another kid, Caden Bradford, who's playing football for the first time in a long time. He played in middle school, played as a kid growing up, but he's been a basketball only guy for a long time. He's as explosive but smooth of an athlete that we've had. Um, you know, I don't, I don't like making comparisons, and that's what everybody will do at this place since George was here. He's not George, he's Caden. He is Caden, and he, he turns your head in only way Caden can. And I'm really excited about the things that he's going to do on the field uh, for us. But we have a bunch of talented kids. Preston Groves is a, a great baseball player for, you, for us that is a speedster and, and a really utility-type player playing a little bit of receiver, getting the ball and fly sweeps. Um, Jackson Runyon had a great scrimmage last night catching the ball. And we have – we have six or seven guys that we can rotate in those skill spots on both sides um, that that can get it done. How, Howard Casterlow is a kid. He started as a freshman at corner, and he's he's playing a little bit of both. So I'm excited. Um, anytime you lose the, the group of seniors that we lost last year, I think the automatic response from the outside looking in is like, well, they're going to struggle. And that that is OK. Like, I'm I'm glad that that's the the outlook because it lets us go play freely and just continue to make progress. And I think that's where we're at. Yes. And I'm uh, sorry uh, for uh, going, going longer, but I wow. certainly I uh, <laughs> appreciate your time, you know, and uh, you know, looking at y'all's schedule, I mean, um, the only thing that I can say, I know the first three weeks is a road game, but I'm glad that you don't have a game on Friday, September 2nd with what's going on in Norfolk uh, that night, you know, with uh, Virginia Tech Old Dominion playing. But, you know, I see that you guys start for real um, uh, next Friday against North Cross and then Labor Day Saturday against Blue Ridge and yep. then the following Saturday against, against Christchurch. And all three of those are on the road. Road dogs. You have to be road dogs right off the bat. And that, that first trip's a long one, man. And and we've made it plenty of times. We we finished our season, unfortunately, last year making that trip. So so we're very familiar with it. But um just great opportunities, man. I, you know, you can look at that one of two ways and, and say, Man, it's a lot of travel in the first month of the season, but you can also look at it and say, Man, you you get through this stretch and we're gonna be at home for a while. In, in the middle end stretch of our our season, so it it's going to be tough for sure. But again, it's it's going to be a challenge that I think that will bring us closer together because you don't have an option. Like we're we're yeah. making a trip, so you better have the right mindset and let's go let's go get it. Yeah, and then uh, you know when you get done with the first three games, not only do you have the next three at home, but they're all local mm -hmm. schools. You know, Atlantic Shores. Uh, Catholic and uh, and Norfolk Academy, uh, their uh, three straight weeks. Yeah, and that's a that's going to be a fun stretch. I mean, you know how it is football wise. You have to go week to week. You got to approach it that way. But but looking at the big picture, um, I feel like it's it's similar to the Beach District in a sense. Like you're all rivals. There's no right. one big rival. Like every week's a big game especially with those local schools. I mean, Norfolk Academy, Academy and ourselves have had battles over the last four or five years where we've gone over there for their homecoming and beaten them, and they've come back to our place the following year and done the same to us, and, and that's always a fun one. Atlantic Shores is another one that, that we kind of traded wins for the first couple of years I was here, and, and Wayne, is, Wayne Lance has done a great job with his program, and they're going to be another tough one. Um, so we love that stuff. I mean, whether we're at their place or, or they're at our place, it's local. We know each other really well, and, and that's always a fun fun level of competition to get to. Right. Yeah, and then it's, uh, it's another string of uh, road games, but it wraps up with that school in Charlottesville that I think uh, somebody associated with the Raiders uh, 
the Long family there oh, wow. at uh, San, San Anne's uh, Belfield. I know that Kyle and Chris played for other other teams, but uh, they definitely have nice facilities there in Charlottesville. They, the, the Longs have their own wing. They do have their own wing at, at Stab. It's right. It's it's their athletic facility. You walk by the whole mural of Longs. I believe Kyle Long is on staff, um, if I oh. heard that correctly. So um, that'll be interesting. They've got a brand new coach for the first time in 25 plus years. Um, so they will look a lot differently. And again, that's another one where you walk onto that campus and it's a different feel, different energy, and, and you kind of you know what you're in for when you go to a place like that. And I love that. I mean, that's if there's one good thing about playing on the road, and that energy. Some people don't like negative. I I think it's great. You know, you go into a hostile environment, you just go play free and and have fun and, and feed off that energy, and that's what we'll do there. But like you said, it's it's a definitely a little bit different constructed um schedule but it it is what it is so we, we just got to go on the road and get it done now how do you do uh uh football schedule because it looks like you know because there's not a tcis there in football right so so what with the uh with the different divisions of the state pools what you just schedule games to try to help your powerpoints or so you know it's a great question because when I when I got here, I had the same question. And right. and our AD TW Johnson handles our scheduling, and I think my head was was spinning so much those first two years, just trying to get a handle of what my responsibilities were. I just let him do the schedule and, and didn't think right. much of it. But at the time that I got in um, to pri private school football, Greenbrier was still playing, HRA was still playing. You know, you had a lot of these other schools as a part of the local um, competition, it, which was yeah. great because you, then you actually you have a carved out schedule with with all the people you need to play. Now, as I've been involved, some of those schools have dropped down to eight men or dropped football together, making it making it a lot tougher. Um, and that's that's why if you look at our schedule, man, we're going all over the place to get games because just like you said. Prior to, everyone had a pretty good mixture of divisional games and out-of-division games. As it's gone on, there's fewer and fewer out-of-divisional games to schedule. So you have to start thinking about becoming eligible for the playoffs and having enough divisional games to do that. And that's kind of how we, we look at it. Um, it was great playing Portsmouth Christian and Greenbrier and those local teams, but if I'm competing with three other schools to get eligible for the playoffs and they only play divisional games or play up a division, I don't want to put us at a disadvantage. I want to at least make the schedule in such a way that we will have a chance when we're good enough and we can earn it versus, man, we just went nine and one, but only played four divisional games. So we're not eligible. You know what I mean? That's yeah. That's how we look at it. Um, I wish we could still have some of those those area rivalries that we had when I, when I first came in here, but I think everybody's in the same boat. Um, you know, I, Isle of Wight is a great example. Uh, we played them uh, my second, third, and fourth years, and it was always a battle. Always a battle because they're right down the road. But right. now, you know, they're experiencing some, some structural differences within their program, and they have to schedule – in the best interest of their program so that they're not an option, but it's a really good example of, you know, schools have to do what's best for them. And I think as a result, it makes it a little tougher to schedule, but uh, I, I have no business saying what they should be doing, just like they, they can't say anything about what we're doing. So it, it just, you do the best you can and, and hope you can find competition that's somewhat close, but like, like you can look at our schedule you're like, man, we're putting some miles on, but it's what kind of what you have to do. Right. And, uh, you know, so let's see. So with the scrimmage, scrimmage last night, first game next Friday, uh, you know, then uh, what? Just uh, no more scrimmages, just uh, practice and it and it kicks off next uh, 
next Friday afternoon. That's that's what I told the kids at in Edenton, North Carolina. You know, had had a few things to say and and just said the clock has stopped ticking. Like it is time. We've got to go. Um, you know, we've gotten our feet wet for the last couple of weeks, but now it's um, coming together, finding your role, dominating that role, and doing whatever you can to help us win. And that's that's how we're going to kind of approach it. But just like you said, you know, the the time for prep is over. Now it's right. either going to get in the boat or it's going <laughs> to sail away, and and that's what's about to happen. But it's exciting. Um, I tell I tell people all the time that ask me, like, man, you, you keep a lot of long hours got to be really tough i'm like it is but it's not it's it's like a a 10 week um 10 week like uh, speedy police chase man you don't think about anything else but getting to the next stop and and you don't realize how hard or how long you've gone until it's over and that's what i love about it um i love the fact that whether you win or lose or it's a close game or not so close you got to shut the the chapter on that boat book and move forward or you're going to let last week's whatever seep into this week and you can't do it. And that, that works really well for me because I'm, I'm pretty tunnel vision type person anyway. Um, wow. But it's going to be awesome. I can't wait with this group because it's a good group, uh, super eclectic. It's the most evenly distributed team we've had in terms of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Like it's almost exact all the way through. We've never had that. So and, it, and it's going to take all of us. So it, it'll, it's going to be good. Yeah. Well, hey, just last thing with looking at your schedule and you talk about, you know, you got to put things in the past and move to the next opponent the next Friday. I mean, with your opponent on September 16th. Now, I don't know what collegiate athletics is now, mm -hmm. but with what we were just talking about and the phrase of going one and oh, I mean, the guy that's now under center in Denver, you know, he's an alum there of uh, yeah. collegiate. <laughs> yeah, that, that was um, – we were fired up to add them to the schedule. Um, so like I said, we've always had at least one above-division opponent in Norfolk Academy. I think for us, if we want to challenge ourselves and, and really separate ourselves, I think you need at least two – or three of those above divisional games, because otherwise you might not get the competition that you need to go far into the playoffs when you are ready, ready as a team. But they're they're uh, they're going to be good, you know. Being a division one team, we know kind of what they're going to bring to the table as far as knowing their personnel and exactly who they have on on their roster right now. I have no idea because they change they change and fluctuate more than we do because they're a bigger school, but. Um, we know that's going to be a tough one and, and we're looking forward to it. And that's, that's how I want our kids to look at it because I think so often, especially with so much information on the, on the web and, and just in social media, it's really easy to say, man, they're going to be really good and be, be defeated before you go up there. But I'd rather our guys say, man, it's going to be awesome. Like we're going to go play a great team and we're going to be better for it. However it turns out, but we will move from that one and take it with us and, and be better for it. And that's, that's how I hope they're looking at it. But our guys are funny, man. They, they get up for, for big games. Um, I get, I'm almost more worried about them overlooking a team and not coming in the right way. So it's not one thing. It's another, man. You're always worried about something. Yeah. And I know, uh, you know, you brought up, a. Uh a great point, you know, with uh, technology, social media. I mean, uh, the days of meeting an assistant or the head coach from the other team and exchanging tape. I mean, now with, now with huddle and not mm -hmm. only is there a website, but you can download an app, yeah. you know, it's just amazing with uh, technology and scouting out your next opponent or, or even for uh your player, you know, to mm -hmm. put together a highlight film and, and send it on to be noticed. Yeah. I think that's, you know, that last point is the biggest one. And there's so many positives and negatives you can glean from social media and technology and, and where we're at right now. But for me, um, uh, it's such an easier process to get a kid recruited. Um, there really is, there's no excuse for a talented kid to, to be overlooked at this point with huddle. I mean, all of our guys 
are publicly accessible to anybody. So when they, they add a highlight, it's out there. But um, it's just a lot better knowing that as a coach, like part of my job at this level was to get kids opportunities to play if they're good enough. And, and with this, man, we do a, a midseason highlight for all of our recruited recruitable guys, and we do an end-of-year highlight for our, our juniors and seniors that are recruitable. And it gets sent to hundreds of schools, and it's not it's after a couple of years in this job, it's not hard to do that because I've got the mailing list to get it out there. Um, they they're better with their social media than I am, so they're constantly sending it out there. Um, it, it just makes it a lot easier. But like I said, the, the flip side of that is, you know, recruiters are over inundated with with recruits, and now they have to yeah. sit through like, all right, this is a highlight. How good is this highlight? What's they have more to look at than they ever have. So I, I'm like you. I was I was in an era where like you bought the box, the box discs, the the DVDs <laughs> of an area. Like in Ohio, that's what they did. Like you get a disc of the top 200 players in Ohio, and you had to buy it because you might not know everybody. So you had to look at. I mean, and and now like to look back at that's laughable. And now you're just like. Just do your research. Go watch film. It's out there. Um, but it's a great time to be a kid being recruited. It's 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 really a much better era of recruitment at this point than when when myself and you were in high school. It was it's right. really good now. But yeah, well, well, Mike, uh, certainly appreciate uh, your time and um, any uh, last minute. Uh, words here um i mean uh with a scrimmage yesterday are the kids off today or do you guys have practice oh, no. today oh no <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah i'll leave i'll leave you with this we played a really really tough edenton football team um we go down to their jamboree every year and it's usually it's usually six to eight teams in the jamboree but that got canceled because of weather we were lucky enough to go down there um, yesterday and just play Edenton. And oh, I'm, so, I'm so glad we did because, like I yeah. said, they're they're a public school. They're always really tough. Um, you know exactly what you're going to get from them. Fit, fast, physical, really talented football team. And that's what they were. But we did a lot of really good things, especially offensively. Um, like I said, I kind of mentioned it before, Gabe – did a great job throwing on time, being decisive. Our receivers, you know, they didn't catch everything, but they made a lot of plays, especially run after the catch. Uh, defensively was tough because they run a triple option, and, and that's going to be tough any way you cut it. But I like the way I like the way we're coming away from that experience. Like that was a positive, and we got live bullets against a really good team. So moving forward, I mean, you can only use that use that to get better. But, um, man, if I could say one thing, just, uh, to, to our players and, and our fans and our community, I couldn't be luckier to be at this place. Um, there's, you hear so many horror stories of parents making things difficult or admin making things difficult. And I just don't have to deal with that here. Um, and it's been great. So I'm just really happy and lucky to be here. Yeah, well, hey, Mike, uh, certainly appreciate that our uh, schedules here could connect and uh, come on. And uh, so I uh, appreciate your time. And if you have a couple more minutes here after we uh, yeah. stop. And uh, so, all right, Saints I fans. So it. that's uh, that's today's episode here with hearing from head uh, football coach Mike. Beal as the uh, as the Saints here get ready to uh, start their regular season next Friday at uh, North Cross. So uh, good luck, uh, Coach, to, the fo to you and uh, your assistants and the football team this year. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Okay, sure thing. All right.